Group processes are shaped by unobservable but influential group structures. All but the most ephemeral groups develop written and unwritten norms that dictate conduct in the group, expectations about the members' roles, and the networks of connections among the members. In this chapter, we will learn about the group structure. We also ask why do norms, both formal and informal, develop to regulate group behavior or we also want to know what kinds of roles are common in groups and how do they influence members. How can the social structure of a group be measured and what are the status, attraction, and communication networks? Now let us answer the question, what is group structure? Groups are not an organized collection of individuals. Rather, they are organized systems of interactions and relationships regulated by group structure. Three important elements of group structure are norms, roles, and networks of connections among the members. Now let us proceed with the next question. Why do norms, both formal and informal, develop to regulate group behavior? It is important for us to know that norms are implicit self-generating and stable standards for group behavior. We have different types of norms. We have proscriptive norms, prescriptive norms, descriptive norms, and injunctive norms. Let us know the difference between such norms. Prescriptive norms are the set of the standards for expected group behavior, whereas proscriptive norms identify behaviors that should not be performed. Descriptive norms define what most people do, feel, or think in the group. Injunctive norms differentiate between desirable and undesirable actions. We also have to be aware that norms develop gradually over time as members align their actions with those displayed by others. According to Sheriff, work using the autokinetic effect indicates that group members do not merely imitate others. Rather, they often internalize these consensual standards. Because norms are transmitted to other group members, they tend to be consensual, implicit, self-generating, and stable. Now let us answer the next question. What kinds of roles are common in groups and how do they influence members? Roles specify the types of behaviors expected of individuals who occupy particular positions within the group. As members interact with one another, their role-related activities become patterned or role differentiation with Number 1. Task roles. This is pertaining to the work of the group and relationship roles which pertain to maintaining relations among members. The same person rarely holds both the task role and the relationship role in the group. Moreland and Levin's theory of group socialization describes the ways roles are allocated to individuals and the ways in which members transition through the roles of prospective member, new member, full member, marginal member, and former member. The role differentiation and socialization processes often create stress and tension for groups and group members. Let us describe these things. We have role ambiguity. This occurs when the behaviors associated with a role are poorly defined. Role conflict, on the other hand, occurs when group members occupy two or more roles that call for incompatible behaviors or what we call the inter-role conflict or when the demands of a single role are contradictory. This is what we call intra-role conflict. When role fit is low, members do not feel that they match the demands of their roles. Now let us answer the next question. How can the social structure of a group be measured? First, we have Social Network Analysis, or SNA. This offers researchers the means to describe a group structure both visually 
and quantitatively. Common indexes used in SNA include density, degree centrality, in degree, out degree, betweenness, and closeness. Paxton and Woody's study of Southern sorority suggested that those members with high centrality indexes for a clique within the overall group were less committed to the sorority as a whole. Next, let us ask, what are status networks? Most groups develop a stable pattern of variations in authority and power, such as status networks, chains of command, through a status differentiation process. In some instances, people compete with one another for status in groups, the resulting pecking order determines who is dominant and who is submissive. Group members' perceptions of one another is also determined the status. Berger's expectation states theory argues that group members allocate status by considering specific status characteristics and diffuse status characteristics. When status generalization occurs, group members unfairly allow irrelevant characteristics such as race, age, or ethnic background to influence the allocation of prestige. The status allocations are particularly unfair when individuals who are members of stereotype minority societal groups are also underrepresented in the group itself, with the most extreme case being solo status or being the individual of that category in that group. In many online groups, the effects of status on participation are muted, resulting in a participation equalization effect. Now let us answer the question, what are attraction networks? A group's attraction network, or in Moreno's terms, social metric structure, develops through a social metric differentiation, a process that orders group members from least liked to most liked. Attraction relations tend to be reciprocal and transitive, and clusters or coalitions often exist within the group that are higher in homophily than the group as a whole. As Heather's balance theory suggests, social metric structures also tend to reach a state of equilibrium in which likes and dislikes are balanced within the group. Social metric differentiation generally favors individuals who possess socially attractive qualities such as cooperativeness or physical appeal. But social standing also depends on the degree to which the individual's attributes match the qualities valued by the group, the person, group, fit. Now let us ask the question, what are communication networks? A group's communication network may parallel the formally established paths, but most groups also have an informal network that defines who speaks to whom most frequently. Centralized networks are most efficient, but according to Shaw, his concept of information saturation suggests not if tasks are too complex and require high levels of information exchange. A group's network, in addition to structuring communication, influences a variety, group, and individual outcomes, including performance, effectiveness, and members' level of satisfaction. Individuals who occupy more central positions in communication networks are often more influential than those located at the periphery. Because centralized networks have lower levels of closeness, the overall level of member satisfaction in such groups tends to be lower. More information generally flows downward in hierarchical networks than flows upward. And the information that is sent upward is often unrealistically positive. Bale's systematic multiple level observation of groups or symlog, it is a model of interaction and structure assumes that structure is based on three dimensions. Dominance and submissiveness, friendliness and unfriendliness, and acceptance to task orientation of authority or non-acceptance of task orientation authority.